Okay. So welcome everybody. Um, we are here for the PhD defense of the PhD candidate Ayub Benamor. My name is Antonio Capone. I am the president of the committee and professor in Politecnico di Milano, Italy. In the committee, we have uh, Anastasios Giovanadis, uh, researcher at Ericsson, Anna Busic, uh, research scientist at INRIA and ENS, Daniel Kaufman. Daniel, are you connected? Can you hear us? Yes, I am. Yes. Daniel is professor at Telecom Paris. Andrea Araldo, associate professor at Telecom Sud Paris, and uh, Tija Nisha, professor at Telecom Sud Paris. So you have 45 minutes for, uh, for introducing your work. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, welcome, everyone, to uh, my thesis defense. Uh, my thesis is entitled Artificial Intelligence for Resource Allocation in Multi Tenant Edge Computing. This thesis is uh, supervised by Associate Professor Andrea Araldo and Professor Tishini Michel. So uh, before uh, beginning, I would like to thank the members of the jury for their time uh, they took to evaluate my work and for that for the time to uh, attend this presentation. So this pre this presentation begins with an introduction to highlight uh, the context and the objective of the thesis. Then I will uh, briefly discuss the literature. Then in chapter three, uh, I will uh, discuss the first con contribution of the thesis, which is cache allocation in multi-tenant edge computing. Uh, I will skip the uh, fourth part, uh, multiple resource allocation due to time constraint. Then I will pass directly to the fifth part, which is uh, the third core contribution of this thesis, dynamic pricing for serverless edge computing. And then I will conclude the presentation with a conclusion and future work. So before diving into details, here I will uh, uh, I will specify the terminology that that will be used in this uh, whole presentation. So in general, in uh, each system of each part, we will have end user that could be a mobile phone holder or uh, augmented reality glasses or gaming console or any consumer. So the service provider will refer to the provider of the application. That could be a video streaming application or, uh, such as Netflix or uh, augmented reality applications or any other kind of uh, applications. The third actor is the network operator. It's the entity who manages and own the uh, network infrastructures and resources. So edge computing is about bringing uh, the resources, computation or storage or storage, for instance, closer to the end user in the edge of the network. This definition is uh, correct, but it's not uh, very precise since it does not specify where exactly is the edge. In this thesis, we actually specify and we, we specify where the edge exists. So in our vision, the edge is in the access network that could be in uh, the center office of the network operator and we will call it Metro Edge. Uh, it could be located in uh, mobile uh, in the uh, base stations and it will be called mobile edge computing and also it can be the resources could be deployed in the smart boxes that uh, come with the subscription of internet and we will call it cloud edge. So the main idea of edge computing and why is it here it's to bring resources closer to the users to enable uh, low latency applications such as augmented reality, for example, or uh, maybe uh, and video streaming, as we will see in the next chapters. So current deployments under the label of Edge are provided now by uh, some cloud providers, such as Google and uh, Amazon. We have Google Cloud Edge and Amazon uh, Lambda at Edge. However, these two deployments are, uh, are actually far from the Edge. They are close to the access network, but they are still requiring passing through the internet because they are uh, in this point, they are not yet here. So uh, it's not, it, it is labeled edge, but it's not true edge in our vision. It is just a closer cloud. Uh, current deployment in, inside the access uh, network. So as we see the edge are from uh, Google Global Cache and Netflix Open Connect. 
However, this vision is a single tenant. So only Google will use the resources deployed at the edge or Netflix will also, or uh, only Netflix will use uh, their resources deployed by them. So it's single tenant edge computing exclusive for the service provider. So we believe that the multi-tenancy of uh, edge computing will help us reduce the capital and operational expenses for network operators, and also to save the deployment and maintenance costs for the service providers. Also, it is not practical to have many, uh, it's not practical to install resources of each service provider, for example, in a smart box. It would be impossible to have such uh, quantity of cables. Uh, one other novelty of this thesis is uh, that we cannot inherit actually the strategies uh, of cloud computing. Since in cloud computing, we have practically unlimited, unlimited resources. However, in the edge, the resources are uh, limited. So the general setting of the thesis is that the network operator owns the uh, resources at the edge virtualize these resources and let the uh, heterogeneous require uh, and let heterogeneous service providers uh, that we call also tenant to distribute a part of their applications in the edge so these heterogeneous service providers could be as i said uh, augmented reality providers or video streaming providers and they independently orchestrate their set of microservices on the edge we will assume in general that the end users pay the network operator if the requests are processed uh, at the resources installed in the edge. So the objective of this thesis is to advance the real deployment of the uh, of the true edge uh, in real networks by the network operator by showing them that uh, the utility that they can extract from uh, edge computing. So such utility can be upstream traffic, minimizing the upstream traffic maximizing the revenue of the network operator or <clears throat> enhance the quality of service perceived by the end users. So we will achieve this uh, we will achieve this aim by designing novel data driven approaches uh, for resource allocation and pricing uh, at the edge. So we will optimize the network operator the, op the, op the network operator relevant objectives satisfying the requirements of the different service providers. We believe that this can uh, contribute to impact the decisions of the network operators about the future deployments uh, of edge computing. Uh, so in this uh, section, I will briefly talk about the related work, the most related works uh, to, our, to my thesis. So uh, in the side of resource allocation at the, uh, at the edge, we see that most of the related work deal with uh, the edge as a single tenant environment, or they assume that there are multiple service providers, but there is no isolation between the service providers. So it's, it is a resource sharing. So basically many users of each service providers can use the resources at the edge, but uh, there, is no isolation, there is no isolation between the service providers, which, <laughs> however, we, uh, we consider resource uh, Partitioning, so the resources are sliced between service providers, and only the users of such of a service provider can use the resources allocated to that service provider exclusively. Uh, also, one other point is that uh, in the literature, works consider uh, that they know partially or completely the system parameters. Uh, however, uh, we do not require any knowledge of the system parameters and we will learn the uh, optimal, and we will learn the uh, uh, the policy of allocating and pricing the resources. Uh, some uh, works that are based on uh, learning, they do offline learning. However, uh, for us, we do not require any uh, knowledge about uh, the, any knowledge of the environment, and we do not simulate the environment to create to uh, to develop our uh, allocation and pricing algorithm. So we are learning on, on up and running systems and we do the optimization online. In the uh, side of resource pricing at the edge, so we have uh, auctions that are proposed in many works. However, auctions lack uh, transparency, which means that 
the use the end user cannot know the the unit price of the resources and hence he cannot uh, expect his his cost so he would just offload without knowing finally how much he will pay or without expecting how much he will pay why in our uh, work we propose a transparent uh, pricing where we announce the price by advance before offloading also uh, game theory was proposed for uh, for resource pricing at the edge and, and game theory requires requiring knowledge of system parameters. Uh, however, we do, as I said, in the resource and location at the edge, we do not require uh, any knowledge of the system parameters. Also, some uh, learning-based strategies for resource pricing are proposed in the literature. However, they suffer from a uh, very low learning phase and they consider uh, nonlinear pricing. However, we consider linear, linear pricing and we will see how it will uh, maximize uh, more the uh, revenue of the network operator. So here I will begin with the first core contribution of the thesis, uh, which is cash allocation in multi-tenant edge computing. So the motivation be behind this, uh, this work is that uh, actually caching uh, plays an important role in addressing the, the challenge of uh, massive data generation. And this massive data generation would uh, imply the congestion of the, uh, of the network and of the available bandwidth. Also, if we see uh, the content of the internet today, we will find that 80% of uh, internet traffic can be uh, represented by multimedia content, uh, for instance, uh, video content. And all this will generate uh, upstream traffic, which is traffic going and uh, going to the internet and going back. And this is actually very costly for the network operator since either it has to uh, install an infrastructure to carry this, uh, to carry this traffic uh, or to, uh, to sign costly contracts with other network operators to receive such traffic from the internet. So, so in our system model, we have uh, a network operator owning cache in the uh, edge node, for example, in a base station, and it owns k slots of cache, and each slot can store one object. And then we have P service providers that are video streaming services, and the content of the of these service providers will be cached here in the uh, in the edge node. So the cache space allocated to each service provider is can be uh, theta pk at times dot k, and the allocation vector is uh, uh, the vector theta of all the allocations. So we assume that the traffic between the users and the service provider is encrypted. So the network operator cannot see the content that the users are requesting from the service provider. And we assume that uh, each service provider has a catalog of uh, NP object with, uh, with the same size. So if we, uh, if we have a content C of service provider P, the, the request rate of such content is uh, the global request rate multiplied by the probability of request of each service provider multiplied by the cacheability of this service provider. So the cacheability means it is actually very important here because it highlights or it specifies if a content is cacheable or not. So we will we would have uh, non-cacheable content such as uh, video conferences, for example, we cannot cache them. Uh, so here the cacheability introduces the cacheability of the content of uh, such service provider P. And then uh, all this multiplied by the, pop the popularity of the object C of uh, service provider P. So uh, generally this popularity follows a ZPF distribution. So the cost of the network operator is the upstream traffic, <clears throat> which means that uh, all the traffic that comes from the internet. So this upstream traffic actually has two uh, sources. The first one is if a user requests, uh, if a user requests a content that is not cached here, so it has to be downloaded from the remote cloud. 
<clears throat> and then the second, uh, so, and this cost will be, uh, uh, will be uh, denoted C nom, nominal cost. And it's actually a, a random variable since for the same allocation, we, would, we can have uh, many values of the cost because of the randomness of the request. So each allocation will have uh, different costs in many time slots. So and this random this randomness, as I said, it comes from the randomness of the request, which we denote uh, omega. The second source of the upstream traffic is the uh, perturbation that does the network operator when it change the allocation. So basically, if I give more slots to one service provider, this service provider will download from the internet the most popular content to fill this extra slots, and then. We will have uh, this uh, C perturbation, uh, the perturbation cost C pairs that depends on the action of the network operator. So uh, at times at times slot k, we will have the instantaneous cost, the sum of the nominal cost and the perturbation cost. So the network operator aims to find theta star, which is the allocation that has the minimum expected. Uh, the minimum expected nominal costs, but this expected value is never observable directly. Each time we observe a noisy realization, so it's basically the uh, expected value of the nominal cost plus some random noise. So this problem is actually a contextual bandit problem where omega, the randomness of the request, is the context. However, <laughs> we will not solve it. Uh, we will not solve it uh, using al uh, bandit algorithms since bandit requires to some jump from uh, an allocation to another, and this may these two allocation may be so far, and then and this and then the uh, <clears throat> perturbation cost will be too high. So uh, we will. Uh, so the network operator in this case will uh, try to find the optimal policy which minimizes the, cumulative, the mean cumulative cost, <clears throat> the mean cumulative cost over, uh, over, time, uh, over time. So basically it will perturb the system until it reaches the optimal allocation, but we try to, uh, to minimize the perturbation to have the perturbations to have the minimum uh, uh, cumulative cost. So to prevent jumping from between two allocations that are very far, we introduced this delta, which uh, we which we call discretization step, and it means that at each time we will give delta slots to one service provider to one service provider and take and take delta slots from another. So this uh, so this will allow us to visit only states. The only allocations that are multiple of this delta, so we cannot change the allocation only with delta. And this will allow us to only reach discretely optimal allocation. So basically, if delta equal one, it will allow us to, to reach the real optimal uh, theta star. So the state space is the set of allocations that we can visit, uh, such as the sum of allocations is less or equal the cap the capacity of uh, of the edge of the edge node and each allocation has to be multiple of delta. The action space is the set of actions that the, the network operator can do, which is uh, adding or subtracting delta slots from one service provi provider to another. So this uh, the presence of this delta will uh, imply that we will have a state, a state space dimension of in the order of k over delta uh, exponent p, where k is the total cache capacity and p is the number of service providers. So this will imply a trade-off uh, depending on delta. So when we have a small value of delta, we will increase uh, the state space dimension. Uh, but however, we will also uh, increase the precision of the optimal allocation. And if delta is so big, we will decrease the precision and uh, we will decrease also the state space dimension. 
<laughs> so to solve this problem, we uh, we use uh, model-based reinforcement learning. So basically, we construct an unbiased regression model of the nominal cost, and to ensure uh, so the model has to be unbiased to ensure theoretical convergence, and then. At each time, we sample a set of random state action pairs from state space, uh, from state space and action space, and we uh, update the policy using these uh, fictional samples. So basically, we will just select an allocation and an action. We will comp uh, compute the nominal cost without visiting this allocation, and then we will update the policy using this cost. So alongside uh, the model, we use some improvements. Uh, for instance, uh, learning grades scheduling. So we will adjust with that the step size of the updates of the policy. Experience in play to uh, use past experience. So past allocation is visited. And epsilon stretch it, uh, exponential decay, which uh, leverage exploration as much as the learning progress. Uh, so, uh, the theoretical, the theoretical properties of our algorithm is that we will converge to a discretely optimal allocation that has the minimum expected value of the uh, of the nominal costs. And we prove in this thesis that if the discount factor gamma is sufficiently close to one, the limit of theta k is the discretely optimal one with uh, it is the discretely optimal state with the probability one. It means here that we will converge to this allocation close to the optimal one, and we will stay there with the probability one. So uh, due to time constraint, I will just present a sketch of the proof of this theorem. So we start by defining uh, the Q table of our algorithm, QK, and the Q uh, table, the optimal Q table. So the first step is to prove that our Q table uh, done by our alg algorithm, it converges with probability one to the optimal Q table. Then uh, if this Q table has, uh, a so if this sequence is induced, this optimal sequence is induced by the optimal Q table, we show that this optimal sequence converges to the optimal, uh, discrete optimal state. The third step is to, uh, so, uh, and let's let's suppose that we have two sequences, one taken online uh, based on this uh, Q table and one of, with, uh, with keeping exploration. And this one is taken offline based on this Q table, but with no more exploration. So we will prove that this sequence, the offline one, can also be induced by the optimal Q table. Then we show that the online sequence converge with probability one to the offline sequence. And then finally, we show that this optimal, uh, this online sequence that are that we are taking on up and running system converge with probability one to the optimal, to the strictly optimal state. <coughs> so here. Sorry. So here. Uh, I plot the instantaneous cost on the uh, y-axis and the time in minutes in the x-axis. So, and we compare our model-based reinforcement learning approach with the model-free approach uh, with a uh, simultaneous perturbation stochastic approximation, which is a method of the of state of the art, and the optimal that we compute, knowing all the system parameters such as the catalog, the arrival rates, and assuming that we know everything. So the figure shows that our algorithm, so in uh, bold black here, converges uh, very fast to an allocation close to the optimal one and faster than the model-free uh, approach. So this uh, speeding up in the convergence comes actually from the model because when we visit uh, many allocations, when we uh, update with many allocations with, without visiting them, it means that it's as if we are visiting, but it's faster than the uh, model free. So the model free will always update the policy by uh, real time, by the real interaction with the system. However, the model base generates uh, fictional transitions and 
we can update uh, with them the uh, policy. If we compare to SPSA, we see that there is a difference between our uh, approach and SPSA. And this comes actually from the, uh, continu the continuous perturbation that SPSA is based on. So basically here, we always, uh, we have always to, per to perturb the system. However, in our uh, policy, we will reach the allocation close to the optimal one, the discrete optimal allocation, and we will stay there with the probability one. So no more perturbation. <sighs> so now I will, uh, so as I said, I will skip this chapter due to time constraint. I will jump directly to the fifth one, dynamic pricing for serverless uh, edge computing. So uh, this work is done actually with a collaboration uh, with the, the Royal Institute of Technology, uh, KTH in Stockholm. With, uh, so uh, we were working with Professor George Dan and uh, my colleague, Feridun Tutumoglu, PhD student at KTH. So the motivation behind this work is, so uh, service computing, basically that we also call function as a service, is a cloud computing model that where the cloud provider allocates uh, resources to users on demand and will charge them based on the utilized resources. So service, serverless computing is popular in cloud computing by its uh, static price uh, that is based on the actual amount of resources consumed by a user. Uh, we believe that this static pricing of serverless in the cloud does not suit edge computing deployments because of limited resources of the uh, edge uh, nodes and because of the highly dynamic environment of, uh, of the edge. So we will have many uh, edge nodes deployed everywhere, geographically, dist uh, uh, geographically distributed among many points that are very different. And so hence the, uh, the need of uh, dynamic pricing. So in uh, our system model, we assume, uh, like in chapter one, that the network operator owns the edge uh, computing, the edge computing node. So uh, the network operator owns uh, K servers of CPU and memory in the edge node. And following the serverless computing model, it provides sets of CPU allocations and memory allocations that a user can ask for. So basically a user can ask for F1, F2, and not uh, uh, F1, F2, and for the memory M1, M2, uh, et cetera. So uh, we will assume that we will have a dynamic population of wireless devices held by the uh, end users. And these uh, wireless devices uh, arrive uh, following uh, a heterogeneous Poisson process that depends, uh, that uh, the intensity depends on time, lambda t. And we assume also that we have good channels condition. So we don't, we do not consider the, uh, the, the latency uh, caused by sending packets. <laughs> so following the serverless computing model, each wireless device has a set of functions, uh, P, so each wireless device I has a set VI of functions and NV is the average number of invocations uh, for, each, uh, for each function in this set of functions. So uh, each wireless device will, uh, will ask for a CPU allocation FB and the memory allocation MV to execute a function, uh, to execute a function uh, FB uh, to execute a function under a latency constraint. So this is the time that uh, that takes a function to be executed. And this is tau bar V is uh, the latency constraint of function V. So when we do not have enough resources in the edge, the user will be queued in a, a waiting list. And <clears throat> so basically it will have some waiting time. And then uh, if, if resources are available, you will start offloading 
and he will send uh, and the wireless device will send uh we send requests following uh, the rate alpha i so alpha i we suppose that it's a random variable following certain distribution uh alpha bar so the wireless device i remains the i amount of time which is the dwell time of the wireless device and this di uh, is a random variable that follows a certain distribution d bar so basically here if we have a wireless device that comes to the edge coverage, it can wait. So this is a waiting time. Then start offload, offload all this, for instance, and then goes out from the uh, edge coverage, and all this is the waiting time, uh, the dwell time. Sorry. So the network operator will set. Uh, So the network operator we set uh, periodically uh, at each TK the prices and the length of the pricing period is delta. During this delta, the price is constant during this TK. So TK plus one is basically TK plus delta. And the price is also constant during all active time, which means that if you are uh, accepted in pricing period P0, you will be charged uh, following the price P0. And even if you leave at T4, you will always uh, be charged based on this price. So you will, we will announce you, we will announce to the user the price and he will, he will and it will stay with it until, uh, until the wireless device finish, uh, finishes uploading. We also consider a non-linear pricing model, which means for each, uh, which means which means for each resource we will have a non a non-linear function of the uh, of the resource with respect to the price. So basically, the price of f is the requested CPU allocations exponent gamma k multiplied by the unit price p k f, which is the frequency unit price, and for the memory. It's the same. So gamma gamma k is a pricing exponent that can be uh, greater or equal to one. And when it's one, it's a linear pricing. And also we define uh, the price per function and vocation. So each time I invoke a function, I will be uh, charged uh, this pi k r. So okay. <clears throat> So each TK, the network operator will decide four, uh, four decision variables, the price for the frequency, the price for the memory, the price for uh, function and vocation, and the, ex the pricing exponent. So as we said, that if the user can expect its uh, unit costs. So we can compute uh, the cost of, uh, so the unit cost of the user, and then we uh, the the wireless device or the user will compare to a certain reservation cost ci bar and then if we and it will offload when the uh, unit cost is less or equal ci bar and it will not offload when uh, the unit cost will exceed this reservation cost of this user so here for instance in the figure we will have that this uh, so basically, the user wants to maximize uh, this uh, function when OI is the offloading decision of the user. When it's uh, one, it means that the user is offloading. When OI is zero, it means that it's not offloading. So it, the user wants to maximize this under the uh, latency constraint for each function uh, in the set of functions. Uh, so here, if we look to the figure, uh, so here, for instance, this user, the wireless device one and three, they are offloading, they accepted the price, and this this user waited some time and then starts offloading. This one offloaded directly, and then they both left the, uh, the edge coverage. However, if we see this one, uh, it, it means that uh, this red cross, it means that the user is not uh, offloading. And so the, the, the OY is uh, equal zero. 
So basically, in some worst case scenario, a user might come here, wait all the dwell time. So uh, it will spend all the time waiting and then just go out of the edge coverage. And this is yeah, without offloading because the uh, because the 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 edge server is uh, saturated. <laughs> so we define the revenue of the network operator in pricing period TK. So rho K theta is the price uh, is the is actually the revenue in a in one time period given a policy theta a policy of pricing. So here we will take all uh, all the revenue uh, from the active time of users that are active in that period, even if they came before that period with uh, old prices. But we will consider that they are, if they are floating, we will consider these old prices multiplied by the request rate of each user and multiplied by the unit cost uh, of each user. So the network operator problem is to find the optimal policy that maximizes the expected value, the mean expected value of the uh, of the of the of the revenue in each period TK. So for that, we can so to solve this problem, we cast it as a hidden parameter Markov decision process problem. So a hidden parameter MDP is basically a class of MDPs where the transition function T and the reward function, uh, function R are parameterized by uh, WG and W uh, by two parameters, WG and WGR respectively, where G is an environment instance of MDP. So basically we will have the same family of, uh, of problems, uh, which is deployment at uh, edge nodes. And these and each deployment is characterized by five parameters, which are the dwell time distribution, the arrival rate of the wireless devices, the uh, the distribution of the request rate of the users, the distributions, the distribution of uh, of the reservation prices, and the number of servers queue. So basically, this formulation will allow us to learn a family of policies that is valid for a large set of scenarios of the that have the same uh, the same characteristics. And then, yeah, so uh, and where each scenario corresponds to an edge deployment and the workload profile, and this will enable us to transfer the uh, the learned policies that uh, we learned before to a new edge deployment without. Uh, without learning from scratch uh, again. So we will adapt the policies, the, 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 this family of policies to a new scenario by adjusting WG and WGR that parameterize the transition function and the reward function. So to solve this problem, <clears throat> we use uh, Bayesian neural networks to approximate the transition function and the reward function. So basically, we can approximate the next state with t uh, with t hat bnn, which approximates the transition, uh, depending on the old state, the action, and the parameter uh, of this uh, transition function approximator, and then also the reward with the same uh, with the same principle. So the main idea of our algorithm is to have three phases of training. One phase is before the new deployment of the new uh, edge node. So before all that, we assume that in the past, we had a set of pre-training problem instances, and we construct the replay buffer for each scenario with transitions and rewards. And then we train these BNNs, these approximators, using the union of uh, all the replay buffers. Then when, so, then this will allow us to learn the family of policies. Then for a new base station, so we have a new deployment, uh, we will have from the time from when we start deploying to a certain uh, time slot the update, we will have two learning phases uh, in parallel. So one to update the WG and WGR to calibrate the BNNs that we had in the past 
to the new scenario. And we will in parallel learn the policy using the real environment transitions and reward. Then starting from T update, we will generate, generate fictional transitions and rewards using the BNNs. And then we learn the policy with, with, the, with these uh, fictional transitions. <clears throat> so here we test <coughs> our algorithm on the Shanghai metropolitan area. So for a cell that is uh, in the city center with high load, a cell in uh, the suburb with a medium load and a cell in the suburbs with the, in the rural, uh, rural area with uh, low <coughs> load. So here we plot the daily average revenue in US dollars and in the, uh, the x-axis is uh, time in days. So here we will have that between zero, the starting of deployment and this T update, we will be exactly the same with the model free reinforcement learning. So basically we do not have here the model. We do not have yet the approximators of T and R, but then starting from this T update, when we do the fictional transitions, we see that our <coughs> algorithm goes faster to much higher revenue than the model free uh, algorithm. So if we see for the three workloads, even for the low one, we will be always uh, faster than the, so eventually we may end up with the same revenue. However, the model based with the, the BNNs will be faster. <clears throat> so <clears throat> uh, I will now conclude the thesis. So we can say in that in this thesis, we gave, at least in our vision, a vision of how the network operator can get the value from deploying uh, edge computing in a multi-tenant setting. <laughs> we uh, developed, uh, so uh, the network, uh, so we, uh, so hopefully we develop, we impact the decision strategies of the network operator to future to deploy edge computing in the future, and we used in our in this thesis uh, novel methods such as uh, data driven optimization, uh, online data driven optimization that speeds up the learning of the optimal policy. So we reduced the learning time of uh, the learning time of the adopted strategies up to scales that are compatible with edge computing dynamics and with also the constraint of limited resources in the edge. So for the future work, so in this thesis we worked on, we worked on uh, one single edge node. So what, what could be done in the future is to try to maximize uh, the, uh, maximize the, the network operator uh, utilities in a distributed nodes in a national scale, for example, where we have multiple edge nodes and there is collaboration between the nodes or between the network operator, maybe. What could be done also is multi-objective optimization with conflicting goals, which means that in, uh, one, uh, in one hand, we minimize latency, for example, for end users, and in parallel, we maximize the resource utilization uh, for the network operator, and we minimize uh, also the revenue of the network operator in parallel and we reduce costs. So basically these goals are kind of, uh, there is a conflict between them and we can try to uh, have multi-objective optimization. One third concern is the environmental considerations of edge computing. So basically edge computing involve uh, using energy to offload requests to the edge nodes and then we, what could be done is to study how to compensate this uh, uh, this energy with deploying edge computing. Is it actually uh, interesting to have multiple edge nodes? Uh, and is is there a balance of energy between between uh, compute uh, between not offloading and executing at the wireless devices, or offloading and executing at the edge is more energy efficient? One other uh, environmental consideration could be the carbon footprint of deploying edge computing and of manufacturing the hardware dedicated to uh, edge computing. So maybe it is better to manufacture many 
small edge devices than big servers. Uh, so that could be studied uh, further after the thesis. Uh, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for your attention and uh, I'm happy to receive questions. Thanks. Thank you very much for the presentation. You stayed perfectly on time. So now we we start with the with the questions. So according to the ordering rule that Professor Scheidt explained me over lunch, uh, we start with the rapporteur, and uh, it's me and uh, Dr. Giovannis, Giovannis, sorry. And uh, since for some reason I'm a senior and also the father coming from Paris. I always get my question. That's the rule. Okay. For the respect. Okay. Only because you are a part. Yeah. <laughs> Let's say that. <laughs> um, so, first of all, congratulations for uh, the work that you did. Uh, I appreciate it uh, and, uh, and enjoy reading the thesis uh, and also the approach, uh, very rigorous and uh, clear that you followed in your, uh, your work and also the presentation that you did. Uh, in, in the thesis, and this as well the presentation that you gave. Yeah. Um, um, let me start with uh, 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 some question on, on, let's say, the model, the first part um, um, regarding caching. Mm -hmm. um, can you better explain uh, uh, what's the perturbation cost and how you exactly, did, why did you decide to model it that way? Mm -hmm. So basically, we the network operator will allocate the cache available in the edge node. So at each time, since we are learning online and we won't, we are we do not have a pre-trained algorithm. We are training online, so we we need to uh, to try many allocations in this uh, to update the pol to update the policy, and each a new allocation it will cause uh, that I give some service service providers extra cache slots and these to fill these cache slots the service provider has to download mm -hmm. the uh, most popular content from the from the remote server so, so it's just a penalty you yeah it's like a be... penalty yes we want we want to minimize these perturbations we want to reach the uh, close to optimal allocations uh, the uh, faster possible so with minimum of perturbations, because a perturbation is actually a penalty. It's a traffic. Uh, it's an upstream traffic. It goes from the internet. It comes from the cloud, pass through the internet. So it's uh, it's consuming you the bandwidth. Call it up, uh, upstream. Upstream traffic. Okay. Yeah. yeah. For some reason, I call it downstream. But it's, fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. It's just a point of uh, uh, name. Um, uh, however, you know the the. The process of alloc uh, modifying the allocation between different uh, um, applications in general could be not that easy, right? Depends a lot on the application. Maybe did you consider that that there may be different impacts on variations on the allocation depending on the application? Yeah. So here, uh, when the network operators, uh, when the network operator give certain cash loads to certain service provider. If these cache slots are already used, or there is uh, caching uh, cached content and it's being it's being requested by users, we do not touch that uh, that cache allocation. I see. Yeah. So we will only uh, optimize through the from the the free the available and free mm -hmm. resources. Thank you. Um, uh, somehow connected to this, um, of course, you know. Uh, you know, modeling this kind of uh, you know systems which are very complex and, and then coming out with some tractable problem is not easy. So I understand the number of assumptions that are necessary, otherwise the problem is it's impossible to be tracked from a mathematical point of view. Um, but you know, uh, how do you see the role of you know uh, the, the details that typically are important in the application caching networks? Uh, and nowadays, the way the caching is implemented is through content distribution networks. Mm -hmm. And content distribution networks usually are managed by third parties, content CDN providers, that somehow interact with the operators, right? They don't directly uh, use 
the capacity of developer. It's not directly the operator managing the caching mm. capacity, but it's through some intermediate players like the CDM providers. And this is typically done not only within the network of the operator, but also uh, within the internet exchange points uh, where some capacity can be provided, right? Yeah. How, how do you see this complexity of the real system compared to the, of course, necessary simplification that we did in the model? Mm -hmm. I think uh, these two uh, concepts are not, uh, in my in my opinion, they are not uh, competitive. So I believe that if we uh, if we provide the resources, actually the resources that are owned by the network operator in the edge, actually we can uh, even collaborate with the content delivery uh, networks, and we can generate some strategies of installing and uh, managing the resources. But uh, I think our role is uh, focused on the presence of these resources at the edge and allocating them among the service providers. So I think maybe in CDN as well, uh, they see the, the service providers. It is multi-tenant, but uh, the, there is no real isolation between these service providers. So mm -hmm. the CDN networks, the content delivery networks, we will have many service providers that are using the resources and there is no uh, isolation and then there is no confidentiality that is now required by certain mm -hmm. service providers. Yeah, I say that unfortunately at the moment, uh, the, even the platforms used by the different content service providers are not compatible between each other. So they yeah. even cannot be supported by the same infrastructure. So the model that you are considering is going in the direction of somehow uh, explaining the potential of uh, using interoperability yeah. and in CDN, which is at the moment very limited and, uh, and try to exploit it with a smart allocation strategy. So for the, the moment, the situation is a bit, uh, more complicated mm -hmm. and you know this inter interoperability is not full at least. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's good not to have uh, this kind of model that can demonstrate the benefits of uh, of uh, this kind of uh, smart allocation, not just based on you know, static agreements between operators and service providers. Mm -hmm. um, um, moving to the, the second contribution that we presented today, which is the dynamic pricing. Um, again, there is one one specific issue on, on the models, uh, which is how to consider the different uh, needs of different services, for example, in terms of latency. So, of course, you consider latency as one of the parameters that is used for uh, giving priority or uh, in the selection of the different uh, jobs. Right? Yeah. Uh, however, there may be applications in which you, you, you have an hard constraint on, on delay, right? If if the delay that you experience is higher than the threshold, then basically the information is useless. Mm -hmm. Is this something that can, can be somehow accommodated in a modeling approach like yours, or it's complicated? Yeah, so here, for for example, if a user requires, uh, for each function, mm -hmm. it, it requires some, uh, sorry, some, mem uh, some CPU allocation and memory allocation. So basically, the user knows its latency requirements, and it will... Uh, so it's up to the user to... Yes, the user knows uh, its requirements uh, in terms of latency, and it will... Uh, it will ask for the memory and CPU allocations based on that latency, so... Basically, if there is enough resources and the user is allocated such resources, so we we consider that the latency is expected in this case. If it's directly modeled as a function of the yes. allocation. Yes. So also also here, I mean, uh, you know, the, the the discussion will be interesting. So again, I appreciate yes. a lot the model and and the way you uh, you, you solved it. Uh, but I just want to discuss with you, mm -hmm. how do you see uh, the, the, the situation in, in reality in terms of uh, different applications and different players? Uh, who is going to really willing to pay for uh, edge computing uh, in, uh, in, in, in different applications, in different scenarios? Yeah. So you assume that the user will pay. Yes. Do we have to expect that this is a common case or there may be other things? So uh, I think, 
So the users, so the deploying resources at the edge, for example, for instance, to run and to execute uh, augmented reality applications, it's a, a luxury. It's not something that is very that is vital, for for example. And then we expect that users, in order to use uh, augmented reality, uh, to use resource to to use augmented reality applications, either in the phone or in the uh, augmented reality glasses. I expect that such users would accept to pay such uh, some extra money to have uh, more uh, to have better quality of service. So maybe the because the edge and will the answer, so the end why answers. not the service provider which is getting some subscription from for the from the user for a uh, defined quality of service. Yeah. So <laughs> yes, the user can. Uh, the user can pay the service providers. Here we do not model the such payment, and also the service provider. If it, there is the uh, the possibility of that, the service provider is paying mm -hmm. the network operator. But uh, here we do on not. On behalf of the user somehow, right? So for guaranteeing the quality agreed with the users. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think it can go uh, in both uh, in both sides. I mean, uh, one cannot. Uh, I mean, one. Uh, shouldn't uh, cancel the other in terms of payment because, for instance, for some uh, resources deployed in the smart boxes that mm -hmm. are delivered with the internet subscription, they actually the end users the end user is already, is already paying the uh, network operator, and I believe it is uh, also practical to have, uh, some extra money to the network operator. It is not uh, so we can see it also that way. Because uh, and also I think the network of the uh, end user is more concerned about the quality about its quality of the. I understand. Thank you very much. Thank you. So let's move now to Dr. Giovannidis, his second rapporteur. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, so thank you also for the nice uh, presentation, and I also appreciate the document. Uh, first of all, I think uh, that uh, I appreciate the, 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 say the, the length and, say, and the different uh, problems that were treated in the thesis. So how, how long was the thesis duration mm. altogether? Three years and uh, like two months today. Yeah. So I think in this, one thing to appreciate is that within this time, it's not evident that the uh, Student will uh, work on so many different subjects. See, <laughs> so it's been so that with very good motivation and uh, quality, quality, and also like touching different of my tools, doing also so all these things are really in favor. And then I was expecting also that at least you know the quality of the document might be a bit less uh, workable, but that was not the case. I think I saw a very good. Uh, and quality of presentation. Okay, now to the oh. um, question. So, uh, so, right. Yeah, so I think that many uh, uh, questions that have been related to system uh, questions are very well uh, posed uh, uh, by Professor Capone. But um, uh, I just want to mention also two more questions about this uh, practical, uh, let's say, or system level aspects is like how how do you see for example that this edge uh, computing uh, idea uh, being uh, integrated in an open run system so uh, if you have thought uh, about that because like right now there is this open run architecture and different uh, uh, let's say partner different players will add their own they have possibly to add their own let's say different design. Yeah. So, how do you see this? Uh, because this means that now this edge computing can be provided also by others, uh, not only by a specific, uh, uh, mm -hmm. let's say, uh, network operator. So, how how do you see this? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, uh, in this thesis, in this vision, we uh, we consider that only the network operators can uh, deploy the edge resources. Because uh, actually, the network operator is uh, sorry <laughs> is the real owner of the edge. Because if we see uh, our vision to the edge, if we go back here, 
we will see that uh, the edge can be in the central office of the network operator. The base station is also owned by the network operator and the smart boxes as well are owned by the network operator. So we think that the network operator is the key to this uh, edge computing idea. And compared to uh, our own uh, architecture, I, uh, architecture, I think the concept of edge computing and ORAN are not, uh, uh, I think uh, they are not in a, a competition. Uh, they are not in a competition. So basically we can make use of ORAN uh, in terms of uh, sharing the infrastructure. For example, this base station is owned by a network operator, but it can collaborate with another network operator that can install its resources here. So. We see it that way compared to the uh, ORAN architecture. So basically we see it as uh, an infrastructure sharing between the network operators. Um, so uh, another, I mean, it's a very classical question, I think, in these uh, um, uh, um, types of uh, edge computing, because you have like this multi tenant uh, approach and then you assume a cache memory at every device. Where is the cache? Where is the cache? Uh, the cache is, uh, we go back to the uh, so the cache is on the base station, on the station. yeah, yes. on the station. So this means that this reduces already a lot what yeah. you were discussing yeah. before the number of boxes, and we're just yeah. stations, that's why. I was talking about yeah, it can be, for example, here in this uh, in this scenario, we assume that the cache, the storage resources, are deployed in the base station, for instance. And this station is like the G node B, or is there also a micro, macro, nano station? Do you consider it a genius, or is it just the main station? Uh, it can be the main station, or it can be some uh, heterogeneous stations, but we only say we only assume. We assume this to be in the uh, base station to prevent that the request goes to the remote cloud. So it's the for the sake of getting uh, the resources closer to the user. Okay, now about this interoperability question also that was posed. There will be some cloud server for sure. So how does this coexistence of this uh, yeah. cloud server and uh, uh, the uh, edge uh, uh, memory like uh, can uh, work together, especially considering that there is not a lot of latency for just one hop, right? Yeah. The, hops, the latency yeah. is very small. So what do you gain uh, from this? Yeah, so uh, the presence of edge computing actually does, does not cancel the cloud computing. It's a complementary uh, paradigm that we consider. And for instance, if, for example, if this, uh, so the, the edge node will be always here to bring the resource and bring the content closer to the user. If such content is not here, it will be downloaded from the cloud server. Also, if we, uh, in the, the chapter that, we, that I skipped in the presentation, we say that if the uh, if the request is not treated uh, in the edge node because of uh, limited resources, it will be treated in the cloud in the remote cloud. It will suffer for from a longer delay. But uh, since the these applications are not, as I said, vital for the human being, so it's just uh, an extra uh, an extra feature. So we can uh, support that. Okay, so one step further is uh, uh, you propose this uh, evolution of the uh, multi-tenant um, the multi-tenant uh, capacity for every tenant, and uh, I guess that if you have like various uh, service providers, there will be some kind of agreement between the let's say network operator and and the mm -hmm. service provider. So if you vary this uh, memory at the edge node, mm -hmm. how do you, will you be able to always support the agreement when there be any fluctuations mm -hmm. in this uh, agreement? Yeah, so uh, 
Yeah, so this concept will involve uh, service level agreements, for instance, and this agreements will highlight the expectation of the service provider and the guarantee that the network operator uh, will uh, provide to the uh, service provider. So basically they can agree on the minimum of resources that the service provider will uh, will request. And then we are we will just change the allocation in the extra slots. So in the free slots, we will manage the free uh, cash slots. So each service provider will have uh, a fixed minimum requirement and then all the available resources will be managed uh, with this algorithm. Uh, so, uh, a question about the technicality of the method that you approach. Uh, so, you have this, uh, practically, you say that you have like a model based on a model three problem. And for me, when I see this is like, mostly you're trying to solve an optimization problem by, R by using RL. So, because uh, at the end, you know, you, after a certain number of steps, you will end up at this like certain, a certain point and then this will converge. Mm -hmm. So um, so first of all, like how standard is this approach that you take here with the plus one minus one? Yeah. And the second is, since you have this plus one minus one steps, which move sequentially, mm -hmm. how do you guarantee that you will not be locked in a local minimum? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh... So for the uh, for this problem of the cache allocation, the problem is convex and it has uh, one uh, global minimum. And why? Because the, uh, actually we in the uh, when we compute the optimal uh, state, so the optimal allocation is only computed when we know parameters. So basically here, when we assume that the parameters are not known, we cannot. We cannot, anyways, model it as an optimization problem because we do not know the arrival rate, we do not know the the catalog size, we do not know the popularity of the content. And about getting to oh, sorry, so here uh, when we prove that our algorithm converts to a discretely optimal uh, allocation and it will stay there, uh, actually when uh, uh, let's suppose that the dynamics or the arrival rate and the popularities change in time. So we will uh, we will keep learning and to learn to learn the new discrete optimal state. So here in this uh, in this model based reinforcement learning algorithm, we do not stop uh, exploring. So the epsilon would never reach zero, and we will always be testing allocations. So if we and uh, since we are we converge in uh, fifteen minutes. So if we converge after 15 minutes and I come here and I change the system parameters, such as the popularity of the content and uh, the workload pro profile, it is not a problem because in other 15 minutes, I will converge to the new discretely optimal state. Okay. Um, about these 15 minutes, yeah. I wrote here. Yeah. For the choice of delta and p equal to three, we get 50 to the power of three, so 125,000 states and 27 actions per state. This gives 3.4 million states action pairs. Mm -hmm. This corresponds to 3,750 changes per second for 15 minutes in order to explore all possible combinations brute force. Mm -hmm. Hence, the approach performs worse than brute force, which means that you converge in 15 minutes, mm -hmm. but in 15 minutes you could have, let's say, Search all possibilities in fifteen. Yes. Yeah. So, I think I think if we go back, if we go back here, actually, uh, so to the uh, state space size. Uh, yeah. So the state space dimension is the total capacity uh, divided by the delta and power to p. So k is actually equal to uh, ten, uh, to ten exponent uh, to five uh, multiplied by ten exponent six, and this is fifty. So we will have ten to the power of uh, ten to the power of five, and then ten to the power of five to the power of p. So allocation. So if we test each allocation one second, we will converge in one year. 
to compute the. Uh, and then I can send you the calculation maybe. Yeah, yeah, maybe we can see it a bit, but that's uh, yeah. But I I saw the brute force command. To... <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, maybe it's. Uh, uh, so uh, some, because because one look yeah because one allocation if we test it once it, it is not correct because there is the randomness of the request we should we should at least give uh, give some time to this allocation to calculate the expected value of that allocation and then if I expect that one second is enough for each allocation I will converge for one year knowing that one second is not uh, really enough if I test just for one second. Uh, the allocation, I will not, I will not have a good, uh, let's say, good approximation of the expected value of that allocation. Um, but uh, the point was that maybe there would be some interest in seeing, let's say, how the delta and the granularity uh, will affect, let's say, the uh, search mm -hmm. the time. Of the search. So, what is that? If you are very finite and you can either get into local minimum, so far you go out of it, and uh, how much time, let's say, is compared to the brute force should be mm -hmm. not shown. Basically. So, uh, for the last part, I only have uh, very few questions. It's uh, um, mostly, uh, yeah, is there, this is the only question I have is that, is there any uh, game relation between how the user is uh, choosing the uh, price, is choosing to be served, and how the price is set between the network operator trying to uh, get as much profit as possible and the user to be served. Yeah. So, so at each time, uh, at each pricing period, the network operator will decide this. Uh, for decision variables. And then these decision variables will be actually announced to the end user, and the end user will calculate the expected cost. So the decision of offloading or not offloading is exclusive to the end user, so the network operator does not interfere. But the network operator actually can indirectly impact the, uh, the offloading decision, because when the system is, uh, is full, the network operator will have the tendency to uh, increase the prices, and hence, when the prices increase, the users will be uh, uh, with more probability they will refuse that price and they will leave the edge coverage. So that's how we model the relation between the user decision and the network operator decision. But uh, I think it depends on the uh, so it depends on the latency actually. If we if the user can execute the requests on the mobile phone, for example, and the uh, latency is uh, and the latency constraint is respected, it will not also it will not offload even if the maybe if, even if uh, even if the uh, reservation price is uh, greater than the uh, expected cost. So if the latency constraint is respected. With, uh, without offloading, so it will not offload because it will maximize, it will minimize the cost for the end user. So, so also the end user is uh, has a strategic decision to minimize its own cost. Thank you, thank you very much. So let's move now to Dr. Vucic, please. So first I would like to congratulate you on uh, presentation that was very clear and uh, that shows the different uh, aspects of your work uh, from uh, modeling uh, uh, aspects, uh, understanding how the system works, and then uh, after using um, advanced uh, elements like the uh, mix uh, So I uh, really appreciate that. And uh, uh, so uh, I'm more familiar. With the reinforcement learning, but a little bit less with the system assumptions. So, so I will start with a couple of uh, questions so just that you uh, can consider it as understanding questions, mm -hmm. and then uh, I'll be going to the technical questions. So, first, uh, there are many, many things that uh, uh, you uh, model as the uh, user behavior or system behavior. So, uh, how prone this is to, error, to modeling errors, and how sensitive is the result? 
uh, on the smuggling errors. So, for example, uh, there are lots of uh, assumptions in the distributions and the form of the uh, cost function. So, so mm -hmm. can you comment on that? Yeah. So, uh, if we see, so I will go to back uh, some backup slides that I didn't show. <laughs> <laughs> So if we go to, yeah, so it's, so it's yeah. So basically we, uh, when we test for, for instance, uh, the distributions of mm -hmm. uh, some parameters, such as for example, the reservation cost, we actually test for not just one uh, distribution. We, for, for instance, for, he, for example, this figure, we plot the daily average revenue in US dollar for a reservation cost that is uniformly distributed and uh, one which is uh, Gaussian distributed. And we always uh, we always guarantee the best uh, performance when we compare to the, for example, for instance, model three or to state of the art uh, methods. So uh, also, oh, sorry. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, and also, uh, and also here, for example, when we uh, when we test the performance of our algorithm for the distribution of the dwell time, we test it with the exponential distribution, deterministic distribution, and uh, real uh, and real traces. So. Actually, we always keep uh, guaranteeing and outperforming, uh, guaranteeing much, uh, guaranteeing better performance than in the state of, of the art. So I can say that the uh, when it comes to distributions of certain parameters, we the algorithm is still uh, is still performing well and uh, uh, and it's it's robust in terms of uh, distributions. Um, but so uh, in the in uh, the experiment, so we made certain uh, assumptions on the on the distributions on the on the cost function, etc. So uh, uh, so you have to test it for something, right? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, then uh, if you uh, if you implement it uh, in practice, uh, I wonder whether it's uh, acceptable to uh, to uh, implement things that are based on um, or basically variance of learning, uh, or it's more appropriate to consider um, the, uh, uh, the the actual regret based uh, 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 reinforcement learning algorithms because uh, while you are learning, you are going to actually pay very high cost potentially. Mm -hmm. You have to explore uh, for a while, and then, as you said, you always continue exploring because the conditions might change. Uh, yeah. System. So uh, why do you want? Yeah. So if we, uh, for for instance, for the uh, first, for the first work of caching, we see that uh, we converge in fifteen minutes. I think uh, such uh, such time is not very important in fifteen minutes in the scale of days because the network operator will uh, actually when we we will collect revenue until we don't know. So basically 15 minutes is not is not that much. Also, if we, if- the, one, one question, this is uh, converging to the same, uh, in 15 minutes, you're going to converge to the- To the optimal. Uh, assume that so the conditions are stationary. Yes, but then- So in the 15 minutes, conditions have changed. So, yeah. so isn't there a problem with some time delay? But you're always applying somehow the best possible solution to fit the means of it? Yeah, so uh, basically the problem of caching is related to video streaming mm -hmm. content. And the video streaming content, if we see the, the popularity, for example, of the content in Netflix or uh, in any other uh, video streaming provider, uh, it will not change in 15 minutes. It may be, we maybe have some periods in the day in which such content is very popular for Netflix or YouTube. And then other period of the day, it will be something else uh, popular. But it, I think the change will be not in 15 minutes. I think the day, if we see the popularity of the content of a, of a video streaming provider, 
maybe in the night we will have some popular content and in the day in the time they it will be other popular content and 15 minutes it seems reasonable compared to the half of one day so, so we rely on separation of time scales with the, yeah. uh, the actual evolution of the conditions of the yeah but this doesn't uh, answer my question. Why not uh, regret these algorithms? So, so did you try that, or uh, it's not uh, applicable? I mean, it doesn't make any sense in your context. Uh, no, actually, we do not. Uh, we didn't uh, apply that. Uh, apply that. So maybe we can uh, implement that, and we see the comparison between the performances. Mm -hmm. One. I mean, I, I'm asking just because of, you started motiv motivating uh, mm -hmm. uh, your. The presentation by uh, okay, this is a special case of contextual bandits, mm -hmm. and then bandits, uh, it's sure it's more classical in this regret based on mm -hmm. uh, algorithms. Yeah. So, so, yeah, <laughs> so naturally, yeah, uh, there is a question. Yeah, that it is. could be the, the comparison between the two approaches could be done, and uh, I think mm -hmm. one, uh, I mean, uh, one doesn't cancel the other, yes. Yeah. 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 So, but so far you didn't. Uh, yeah, so far uh, we didn't apply the regret based uh, algorithms. Okay, so uh, then we, uh, I have a question about uh, the uh, your uh, approach with the discretization. So, uh, I mean, for, as you mentioned, that's like you take the delta equal to one, then you get the optimal solution, but this is totally combinatorial mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in nightmare. Uh, so, uh, why considering uh, again the full table and not some function approximation based on reinforcement learning algorithm? Mm -hmm. uh, Did you try? Uh, no, we uh, we tried in the uh, so uh, in this first uh, in this first chapter. So we have only one resource, and we which is the cache, and we believe that the state space is not that. Large anyway, so we can we can always here rely on the Q and in the uh, tabular method, and then in the second chapter uh, that I uh, that I didn't uh, present here. So we said that now okay we have two resources, and then the space uh, the state space now is uh, more important has a more uh, bigger dimension, and uh, and then I use the uh, uh, function approximation method. So. Not no more Q uh, Q table and no more table. For, for this problem, it just worked. So yeah, it, it, it just works and right? uh, it worked with the delta. So yeah. And then uh, well, uh, uh, slide nineteen. Nineteen. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I mean, these tables are always dangerous, right? I mean, these uh, plots are always dangerous. So because. Uh, it also depends on any reinforcement algorithm will depend on hyperparameter tuning. So uh, typically uh, for the uh, model three uh, RL, the your plot suggests that, that the uh, learning parameter was kept aside. Mm -hmm. uh, so how did you choose the did you do some exhaustive search of the parameter space or did you just take some same uh, uh, one, uh, parameter for, for the model phase of model three? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, okay. So, indeed, in this work, I started with model three without the, mm -hmm. uh, without the model. Uh, and then, uh, so I had I had to run many experiments of many uh, hyperparameters to select the best ones. But uh, as for example, if we see, if we see gamma, so and then uh, with model based, I just inherit the same parameters. But then for selecting gamma, particularly, it has to be uh, it has to be high because uh, if we see the uh, so if we see the convergence, uh, the proof of convergence of uh, our algorithm is based on the fact that this gamma must be very close to one because uh, so the choice of gamma is uh, based on this convergence theorem but uh, all the other are uh, but all the pa other parameters are just i did an exhaustive search since the beginning to select the best one with the second white has to be close to one because uh, you also have evidence i mean yeah even if i let uh, come up to uh, yeah uh, mm -hmm. 
one of the yeah, so the algorithms that are adapted to large scale scenarios. So, yeah. So uh, here, but, uh, but then uh, in the uh, you take this one factor of small, uh, much smaller than one, which is pretty fast. But I, I, for me, it's not the problem of convergence, it's the problem of actually uh, the solution that we will get. So if you're interested in average case performance, so then, uh, mm -hmm. then uh, maybe you take a very small gamma, that's great. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah so, so usually we have better convergence if you have uh, this one factor that is very, very small. Yeah, so here, for instance, why it has to be close to one? Actually, theoretically, we compute this limit by uh, computing the the difference of cumulative costs between the between the opt discrete optimal allocation and the uh, and our allocation. And this limit actually, and this difference of cumulative costs actually depends on gamma, and it goes. Uh, and the probability will go to one when gamma, when the limit of gamma goes to one. So theoretically, that's why we choose gamma close to one. And I think that uh, gamma close to one is reasonable because when gamma is close to one, it means that we give higher uh, weights to uh, future rewards. And actually, that's that's reasonable in this case because we want to have uh, we want to have a long term uh, best allocation. So we will. We will minimize the perturbation. Uh, we will minimize uh, the number of perturbations so that we do to the system in order to have a long-term uh, optimal allocation. So this allocation will give the best expected nominal cost to the to the system. Um, and, uh, yeah. Uh, so, so uh, uh, the second in the presentation or the second the... part of the presentation. Yeah. So second yeah. uh, that you presented today. Uh, okay. So uh, uh, well, uh, I had many, many of model questions that are already asked. So, uh, <laughs> so I'll just uh, ask uh, uh, maybe a uh, um, possible an extension of the work. Mm -hmm. uh, did, uh, is it possible to consider fairness issue in this context? Mm -hmm. because, uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, there might be some uh, variance that you guarantee some base, uh, basic level of uh, uh, service for each, uh, uh, each participant, but then uh, there, I mean, there are more, uh, the different uh, definitions of fairness, can you include them here? Yeah. How, what would you suggest? Mm -hmm. So, uh, in terms of fairness, in uh... Oh, Regarding I mean, this, uh, some costs and then just run the uh, optimization algorithm. Uh, the problem is that uh, you might actually use uh, lose some uh, um, uh, some users in the, in the system because they don't get uh, service at all, or they don't get a sufficient amount of services. So, uh, but then moving from there, you could also define a uh, different fairness criteria and mm -hmm. include that. Uh, here, so have you tried yeah. how would you know it? Okay, yeah. So uh, regarding this uh, chapter, we did we didn't say uh, study the fairness actually of the algorithm. However, we uh, however we can say that uh, this uh, pricing scheme is more fair than, for example, uh, user centric uh, schemes because here the price will not depend on the user. Okay. I don't know what they mean. Let me give you lunch. Yeah. That's what I mean. You can close all the Bible books. Yeah, yeah, it, it didn't work. Uh, so you can uh, come on the Bible Yeah, now it's better. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So for this, uh, 
for this pricing scheme, actually, it, is, it doesn't depend on the user. So each pricing period, we will have the same price for all the users. So we will not be, uh, uh, so there is no user discrimination. It doesn't mean that if you have more money, you will uh, offload more. So we believe that this scheme, because if you propose the same price for many users without knowing which one is the richer and you let them choose, so eventually you are not obliging the the one with most uh, with most money that he will offload. So and also one other thing is that this price uh, once a user uh, one once a set of users here are charged with this price they will continue with this price. So it means that even if they are richer than expected. Uh, we are not getting any uh, we are not getting any profit from that so this scheme is uh, even though we do not uh, analytically an, uh, or we do not analyze the uh, the fairness of the this pricing scheme it seems to be more fair than these user centric that change price uh, for each user and they change price for each pricing period so here it speaks for all users it uh, speaks so so the only potential uh, problem is that it might be too high for some users. So they don't yes. Just pay for yeah. It. Okay. Oh, maybe just one last question. Yeah. Um, yeah, you had this uh, sort of two level uh, optimization problem at the very end of the uh, So on the user uh, problem, uh, do you have uh, any, uh, some uh, guarantees that uh, the solution is unique? But the you mean the uh, yeah, the user because you have a uh, 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 the uh, network operator uh, problem and then user problem so uh, uh, network uh, operator problem I guess will use the solution of the user problem mm -hmm. but then uh, is the solution of the user problem unique and uh, the actual solutions so... yeah I think uh, yeah. I think that the user problem is uh, we do not solve it explicitly. So here we just develop, we just provide the algorithm of pricing for the for the network operator. But uh, we we do consider this this constraint. However, we do not. Uh, so we do not directly solve the problem of the user. Actually, we just we, okay. It's so, just uh, a manner of. Uh, of constraints and then of loading condition. It's not, uh, so this is not the direct optimization problem. So here it basically means that the user will only offload if the reservation, or if the unit cost is less or equal to the reservation cost uh, under the, uh, while verifying the latency constraint. So here OI is the, decision is the offloading decision of the uh, 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 of the user so if oi is equal to one it means that this uh, so it means that the user wants to minimize the cost uh, while uh, while uh, verifying the latency constraint while while verifying for each uh, function of its fun uh, of its function set the execution of this function is less or equal to this, uh, this latency constraint. So this O i is can be only one or zero, and it's and it only depends on the user actually. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let's move now to Professor Kaufman, Daniel. Can you hear us? Yes, I'm okay. just unmuting. You can go ahead and ask your questions. Okay, great. Ayub, thank you very much for your presentation. It was uh, very clear, right in time, as it has been mentioned by the president. Um, I have a few questions. First of all, I consider that the topic of your PhD, it's uh, extremely relevant and the uh, there is a key problem today in the market because there are not enough investments by the different players in a, uh, in mobile uh, edge computing in general. 
And we need to find a way to speed up a, a, this type of deployment. So again, a, a, I consider that the topic is a, a very relevant. Now, when we are talking about a, a edge computing and in particular mobile edge computing, there are some use cases where the, the, the relevance is a, a very clear. If a, we are talking about real time, for example, and you need to, to latency constraints. Now, when we are talking about a, a caching, the issue is not so uh, direct because uh, the closer you are from the final user, the less the commonality of a, uh, the, um, the um, I'm sorry, I'm missing the word, the popularity of a, uh, the traffic. You have a reduced number of users, so it's not that clear that, a, a large prob uh, that you have a large probability that more than one will require the same content. So did you do any analysis of a, what are the statistics on a popularity at this scale? So, uh, yeah, uh, so actually we, do, we didn't do any, uh, so we didn't do any analysis of the popularity. So we assume, we just assume that so the popularity of each content, it, uh, it follows a ZPF distribution. And mm -hmm. actually, we didn't take uh, we didn't take into consideration of how this uh, of how this popularity will change. I expect to be uh, I expect that the popularity of video streaming providers and of content <laughs> would be uh, periodic during the day, the day and night. I expect that, but I didn't fully analyze uh, the popularities of each content provider. Mm. But you, you, you got my point, right? If you cache a, a given content a, a, because a, a, one of the users a, a, has to watch a movie or whatever, yeah. if the probability that another user that a, is a served by the same a, a mobile station, the a, a, a mob base station, is very, very low, your gains will be very, very low as well. Yeah. So when we are doing caching because you are deeper inside the network, the, use, the number of users is larger. So this probability of having more than one user watching the same issue is uh, larger as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not that clear for me that uh, when uh, push, putting this type, this type of caching for movies uh, uh, at the uh, base stations is that relevant. So I don't know. Maybe it is. I'm not saying it is not. It's just that I uh, wanted to know if you had some feedback from a, uh, any content provider or telco to check this uh, um, this parameter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, actually, we here we con we consider such problem just for the to. Uh, so it's actually the utility of the network operator. We are. Uh, so the network operator is concerned by the uh, traffic that goes to the internet. So, so it has two choices, either to install infrastructure to carry this traffic or to, uh, or to sign contracts with other network operators. So in any case, the network operator has to invest in this, uh, has to invest for the video streaming uh, application because they are the ones that consume more the bandwidth. No, so, that, that that I agree. Are you, I, 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 I mean, I, I think I am miswording my question, and that's why uh, you are not able to to answer. I, I will try to word it in another way. I perfectly understand the benefits of caching in order to avoid the uh, paying for network or investing in resources. That's pretty clear. You explained this very very well. I have no issue with that. Now the question is whether you where where at which place you will put the cache. The closer you put the cache from the end user, the lower the probability that the cache is going to be used, yeah. right? Yeah. Because you, there is less probability that two different users will request the same content. Mm -hmm. So my question is about how relevant it is to invest in caching in this particular place, because it may happen that those probabilities of a uh, more than one user requiring the same content is very low. Uh, Could yeah. be, I don't know, I'm just asking. Yeah, okay, yeah, I see. So, uh, yeah, so basically, yeah, I, now I, I get the question. So for us, the possible locations of that, uh, where the edge resources will be uh, deployed are the central offices of the network operator, the base stations, or the uh, smart boxes with, uh, coming with uh, the internet subscription. So for 
that particular case of caching, it won't be in uh, the smart boxes since it's the very small scale and the prob the probability that, and actually it will be only the the user of that smart box. It will be only it will be the only user that asks for content. So maybe if we install it in a, a base station or in the central office, maybe maybe in the central office the uh, the load will be the probability of one other person is requesting uh, mm -hmm. that content is bigger. So maybe if we, I think, mm -hmm. think increase the scale of uh, deploying the edge resource, the uh, more util that uh, that this uh, that this caching will be. Yeah, but if you're putting this in a more central office, this is something that telcos are doing for a long time already with transparent caching, right? They put cache there to reduce the cost, as you explained it very clearly. Mm -hmm. They call it transparent cache because it's just something they do for the internal uh, objective to reduce the cost. So I was wondering whether to put it really in the edge, as you are proposing, will 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 add some benefits. But let, let's move to another question. Uh, another issue is uh, uh, the fact that the uh, having something a uh, local as as uh, you are proposing could be relevant if a uh, you have some local event and that uh, different users are watching the same thing because there is something local going on a uh, i don't know a footload game or whatever type of things that could be there right yeah so there is a there is a goal and everyone wants to watch uh, the goal again and again because uh, there are a uh, in the watching a football game in place so, but the, uh, the point is that these are rare events. It's not something that you can learn a, uh, as you propose uh, with a, the learning approach, right? These are what we call in mathematics, rare events somehow. The probability are very low. So how do you deal with these issues in, in, in your system? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so basically the decision of the network operator is just to allocate this cache and then the most popular uh, content will be downloaded there but i think that the popularity of uh, of the content uh, I, I i think it does not only depend on some events because if we see for example the catalog of netflix during uh, one year mm. for instance uh, are you so, sorry to interrupt uh, again it's my wording that is not good i i fully agree with you Mm -hmm. There is a lot of content which popularity doesn't change that much on time. What I'm saying is, let's suppose that you have content that arrives, for example, in YouTube, mm -hmm. because there is a specific event. You have a football game and okay. there is a goal. Someone uploaded they, this a short movie, short video. And then you have plenty of people that are trying to watch this, but around you locally because they are sharing the same uh, they are in the field right they, in, in the place where the, the the event is going on so yeah. this is why i'm talking i mean there is something that became very popular at a given time during a short period of time and then it it, it, it disappeared or the, the popularity will reduce very much so a, uh, this is a kind of rare event yeah and therefore it cannot be a catch by the learning process uh, you are proposing do you have an alternative for that? Because these are the type of cases where I do believe that having a local caching at the edge could be very relevant to deal with this type of local events. Yeah, so uh, in this uh, case, we do not address, uh, in this work, we do not address this issue because we always order the popularities as they are and maybe one, uh, this rare event uh, as maybe uh, it will not be seen or it will not be seen by our algorithm and maybe this mm -hmm. uh, problem could be addressed in uh, in the future yeah, it would be very relevant okay yeah, i see um the other question i had was related to something i, I just mentioned is that the telcos uh, have been implementing a transparent caching for many many years already Mm -hmm. And uh, my question was about uh, how do you see the business model for the telcos? Uh, do do you see that uh, they will they could move into what you are proposing to reduce the cost only, or do you think do you see uh, other type of uh, business models where they will charge the uh, not if end user but the service provider in order uh, the quality of their services to be enhanced? 
And if this is the case, uh, uh, can you comment on the neutrality issues over the internet? Mm -hmm. I see. So, uh, yeah, so here in uh, what we propose, uh, I think paying for, uh, I think here the network operator has interest in this cash. I mean, uh, it's not like uh, the other cases. Here, the network operator is uh, is obliged anyways to pay something. So I believe, or uh, actually, uh, there was even papers to prove that this strategy is uh, costs less for the network in the network operator side. So it is better to invest in edge computing than investing in other uh and following this uh this business model than following other uh, strategies so if it will if it will be investing in infrastructure it will be uh more costly to the network operator okay i i have a last question which is uh, related with the uh, second model i mean the third one but the second you presented yeah Mm, uh, by doing so, the user cannot uh, evaluate the total price of a uh, the action he's undertaking, watching a movie or whatever thing he's doing, um, a priori. So it's very difficult for an end user to 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 decide to move into a um, running an application or whatever whatever if mm -hmm. they cannot estimate a priori what will be the total cost. So you may say it doesn't matter, they will start and then if the cost increase too much, they will stop. Mm -hmm. But this in terms of quality of experience is not that good. Uh, this is one issue. You may say also, okay, but if they becomes too expensive, they will use their own resources. Yeah. But in my opinion, if they do have their own resources, uh, why they should they uh, offload it to the network at the first time? So mm -hmm. it's something that is not very clear for me uh, how uh, we are going to manage to to provide the uh, a quality of experience that they uh, will make that uh, such a type of service will succeed. Mm -hmm. Okay. With this so, price, with this pricing approach, I meant. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So for the first part uh, of the question, if we see that uh, if we see what when the network operator decide the prices. The network, the user will know these prices and can expect expect a unit cost of execution. Then the, I think, in my opinion, that the users, the end users in an edge coverage, I think they have some estimations, uh, some estimation of how long they will stay there. I mean, if, for example, if I am a user of an augmented reality application, which, for instance, uh, I don't know, Pokemon Go or whatever, I I I know in advance. Uh, I can estimate in advance how much I will be playing and the price, the total price that I will be paying depends actually on this total active time uh, and the uh, unit cost that I can calculate because I know the uh, the price set by the network operator. So, ah, I, okay. so I may sorry, have sorry. about how much uh, I can pay. No, I think I misunderstood your model. I had the feeling that the price was changing on time every delta if i remember well or yeah but for uh, for one user if uh, sorry if one user is accepted in a pricing period uh, t4 for example it will be priced following pi4 and this pi4 will be fixed even if he live uh, in pi15 or oh know. yeah that's so much clear okay okay i misunderstood the model okay thank you very much that's pretty clear thank you